so uh, thank you for for having me here first and um, and uh, to start I will preach a little bit to the choir and show the sun uh, as it, as it was a couple of days ago measure uh, observed with the STO satellite and this is also the sun also a couple of days ago the, actually these two images were taken more or less at the same time just at different wavelengths the one on the left is in if I'm not mistaken, 600 nanometers. The one on the right is in the extreme ultraviolet around, I think, 17 nanometers, so very short wavelength. So as you can see, with the shorter wavelength you go, the more stuff you start seeing in the surface of the sun. Um, so uh, this is, again, the sun uh, extreme ultraviolet. And, and if zoom permits, you're, probably, you're also going to see the transit of Venus that happened in 2012. And um, having in mind that the sun is so um, uh, full of stuff in its surface in the ultraviolet, detecting a tenuous atmospheric signal in Venus would be probably very challenging when you go to, to these wavelengths. So yeah, observing atmospheres in extreme or far ultraviolet, is, uh, it can be hard. But what we do have going for us is that UV transits, sometimes uh, they can be pretty deep. And uh, the most extreme case that we have is for the warm Neptune gj 46 b for which we have um, a transit depth of 50%, around 50% in the blue wing of the Lyman Alpha emission. And this was observed with Hubble. Now, the reason why the, the transit of this planet is so deep in lemon off is because it's surrounded by a large cloud of hydrogen. It's a, the exosphere of the planet extends to, uh, to very, large, very large scales, and it actually dwarfs the, the whole star, which is seen right here, if you can see my mouse. Um, so it, if left alone, the exosphere GJ4-6 would be quickly swept away by radiation pressure and ionized by the irradiation from the whole star. But it stays, that, even, uh, even then it stays in there. So there has to be something feeding the exosphere of the planet. The process that feeds the exosphere and it stays in there for a long time for us to observe is the process of atmospheric escape. Um, and the reason why we are interested in doing these observations of atmospheric escape is because uh, we think that escape um, is one of the most important avenues for atmospheric uh, evolution in sub jovian planets. So observing ultraviolet wavelengths can inform us about the physics of the atmospheric evolution in, in exoplanets. The problem is that, as I showed in the beginning, it can be very challenging because of all the crap in the stellar surface when it goes to short wavelengths. So with, with that in mind, I will, if I can pass my, there you go. I will propose three methods to deal with stellar activity in the in ultraviolet. By the way, when I mention ultraviolet, I mean medium to far ultraviolet or shorter than that. So the three methods that I propose are, the first one is just pure brute force, just repeats, repeats, repeats your observations until you can beat down activity in the face. Second one is simultaneous photometry. Third one is simultaneous spectroscopy. Now for the repeated observations, uh, the brute force method, I, I will show as an example the, the results from the PUNSAT program, which was a large program to observe uh, atmospheres in exoplanets. And the objective of the ultraviolet observations in the program was to detect atmospheric escape of hydrogen and metals like carbon and nitrogen and, and so on. In the, in the exospheres of these planets. And then, as I said, the main strategy for this program was the brute force approach. Usually we observe at least three transits per planet in the EUV. All right, and when you do this approach, you can start finding all kinds of uh, things happening in your, in your star. So for instance, you can detect rotational modulation in far ultraviolet, even for M dwarfs as inactive as gj 6 um, it also depends on the baseline that you have for your observation. Since GGF, the rotational period of GJ426 is 40 days, so you need a relatively good baseline for that. 
Uh, in short time scales, you can also detect large scale flares that increase your UV flexes by a factor of 10, which is the case of this class X flare in GJ3470, which is also an M dwarf that holds a, a warm Neptune. Now, you not only have these large scale flares, you can also have what I call micro flares. And these are not very obvious when you plot the, the light curve uh, that you measure with the HST. So what I did to, to identify the micro flares was to do a flux versus flux correlation plot. And when you do that, you're gonna have most of your fluxes uh, accumulating in the lower left parts of the plot. This is the quiescent state of the star, uh, of the fluxes of the star. And when, whenever you have uh, data points in the upper right part of the correlation plot, you have a micro flaring state. So this is how you identify them in these uh, data sets. And finally, depending on the baseline that you have, you may even find a, a suggestion of a magnetic cycles affecting the modulation of the UV emissions from your whole star. So there are many advantages to doing the brute force approach. So you can tease apart many different processes that modulate the stellar UV emissions, including episodic planetary signals and star-planet interactions, for instance. The problem is that it takes many HST visits and uh, they're not very easy to come by. So if you want a, a cheaper, more pragmatic approach, I propose simultaneous uh, observations. So one example that I can give is one program that we had last year to do a lemon alpha transit of VSTEC AB. It's a young, very young, 45 million years old uh, Neptune science planet. Um, and our idea for this, the strategy for this program was to schedule our HST visit to coincide with a simultaneous test observations. This planet was uh, being revisited with tests back in July last year. Now, the, the problem, and this is very unfortunate, is that TESS decided to do a downlink exactly when we had our HST visit um, scheduled. So unfortunately, we actually do not have strictly simultaneous photometry for our data set. But we can still use the TESS data set. Uh, for instance, I've been working with Brett Morris to do something that actually Ben showed before. Uh, we have, this, uh, we have the test photometry and are trying to figure out what, what's the position and the size of the star spots in the surface of the STEC A. And then we will, what I plan on doing at least is to interpolate during our, to interpolate to the times where our HSC transits happen and then infer um, on how the star spots can affect our HSC observation and how we can interpret that. Two minutes. Okay. Um, for uh, yeah, two minutes. Um, so for simultaneous spectroscopy, what I, um, is the third approach? I don't have a practical example at hand for that one. I am aware that people have observed simultaneously with HST in ultraviolet and also with ground-based spectrographs before, but I couldn't find an example for exoplanet transit observation. So if anyone had, knows of one, just let me know. But what what I have found out recently is that when you let's take the sun as an example again and uh, we have this uh, data set of solar r h and k index for the uh, measured harps north we also have the lyman alpha radiance measured sdo with the eve instrument and when you plot these two for this particular uh, uh, time window you will see that they actually pre uh, match each other pretty well. In orange is the solar RHNK, and in blue is the solar Lyman alpha radiance. And they here on the right, you have the correlation between the two, which is actually, when I was uh, uh, taking a look at this data, it was actually, correlation was actually stronger than I was expecting. But my proposal is that we can use these simultaneous RHNK indexes observations to correct for stellar modulations in UV when you observe with Hubble. You can tease up our activity from planetary signals. All right, and with that, I will leave you with my, with my three methods that I propose, and I will be open to any questions that you may have. Thank you. 
Uh, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, we actually uh, don't have time for questions, so we're going to move straight on to the next speaker. But if you have questions, please put them in the Slido um, and our speakers can answer them um, after their talks.